I've got a pray. I don't know if he <clears throat> prays. I don't know if he. I guess he's okay with it getting out. Joe, you know, he drives a tanker now. Yeah. A tractor and trailer and tanker. He holds about 80,000 pounds of fuel. And uh, where, he, where he got any truck there, they did a walk around. But the guys before that told him that uh, everything was fine. He was okay, you know. Didn't have to check it, I guess. But, uh, Joe started checking and his left front driving tire, the rim. Did you see a picture of that? It had a split like that. You could stick a quarter through that thing. And then on down, it was split too, but it wasn't all the way through like that. Mm -hmm. If Joe had drove that truck and maybe hit a little pothole. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Who knows what would have happened? Yeah. 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 And lucky Joe was, uh, you know, he's a, I drove tractor and trailer. You know, as as time goes on, you get a little bit more lean and checking your truck mm -hmm. out. And so he's new, so he probably really checks it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, Praise the Lord. Boy, that was someone that that sure was. was. Uh, it sure was. Yeah. Well, you showed that to you Sunday. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a crack in the aluminum rim. The, almost, almost the entire circumference. Yeah. Almost. And that was a big crack. Wow. Yeah, you can put a quarter through that sure. anyway, you know, in, in most of it. Absolutely. You never see things like that. <laughs> that's right. Normally. Yeah. yeah, they tell you to do your pre-trip and all the different points of inspection, you know, but like you said, yeah. sometimes when you've you been get driving, in, you, you, do, you get in a hurry and you make assumptions. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, because he, you're carrying flammable material like that. But yeah. I mean, they, there's no margin there. Yeah, okay. Hey, anything else? Yeah, yeah. I just praise the Lord that we're getting started here on the roofing project. Yeah, I, yeah. I keep bringing it up, but yeah, it's just no, exciting. it is exciting to see this moving along. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. We've been, I've been yeah. doing this since February. Looking at yeah, all that, so. yeah, we talked about Lord. you know trying to find the right contractor and then the, the funding for that. And yeah, I they so. Just after you left, they showed up. Whatever time that was, I don't know what time. Uh, oh, about nine o'clock. Yeah, oh, okay. I heard some commotion, and uh, yeah, they were putting stuff on the roof. I guess this is all of the um, styrofoam. Yeah. It looks really heavy, but it's not. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, I thought there were shingles on no. there. They're starting the shingle roof on Monday. They're bringing the shingles on Monday when they come. But uh, yeah, real nice guys. The uh, I had a nice conversation with with uh, there were three of them, two guys from Charm, and then the uh, delivery guy. So yeah, yeah, we pray that they'll do good, good work and shit next week. Uh, <clears throat> Nick joining us. Okay, good. Morning, Nick, how you doing? Good morning, guys. We're supposed to start on uh, our sidewalk Monday too. Okay. Pray for my brother. He's driving from New Hampshire on Monday. Let's get here on Tuesday. And he has sciatic nerve trouble. And he's, just, uh, he's not driving straight through this time. What's your brother's name? Mike. Mike, that's right. Usually taking about 12 hours. So he's dividing it up. <clears throat> okay. The Winkles aren't going to make it this morning. They've had a lot of storm damage up their way so they got a clean up day their basement i guess uh, got flooded pretty good i'm not sure how much and limbs down and you know power out internet out all that kind of stuff so they're uh they're dealing with that today and of course like i said ron's out of town today so. the parents or the kids uh that would be the parents nick yeah okay Kathy, yep. do they live far from chris no, they're they're actually pretty close up in that. Uh, I guess that's Elwood, a, Elwood. Yeah, Hill. that's what I thought. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You have any damage down around there, Nick? Um, no. We were pretty surprised that we didn't even see a tree down. It was pretty good winds last night. Yeah, our but, road is closed. I got that storm coming back last night from West Virginia down around uh, where the first rest stop is 79. What is that down there? 
But it rained so hard, you couldn't already see the drive, so I got the cranberry. I think we drove about 35, 40 mile an hour. And yeah. You yeah. couldn't see. Yeah. I tried to stay behind somebody so I could see their taillights. <laughs> Just hope you hope they're going the right direction and staying on the road. Really. I'll tell you something happened when I was in West Virginia. Of course, I got that Honda, and we want to go with that second time. Well, I'm doing a thousand miles now. I forgot that. I was going down the road, and I, I don't know how fast I was going, maybe, I don't know, 60, 65. This car came around and came over on my side, and my brakes. Oh, oh. You didn't even brake. It did it for you. It yeah. broke on a man. I go, what in the world happened? Hannah said, well, your brakes went on. That's what happens when somebody comes over or you go over, you know. Oh, boy. That's a, man, that thing gives you a whiplash. Yeah, when you're that's not. That's if a guy behind you, he's going to rear in you. I know. Yeah. Where they follow, you know. Yeah. I didn't know it did that. Yeah, it's a safety feature. So it's safety, <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray so we can get into our study. Scott, would you mind? That looks, looks like you jotted down most of the things what there. What was the uh, first uh, person that you mentioned, Larry? Uh, John. Or John Ritter. John Matt. Uh, what, what was the issue? Which one, John? Uh, I got Matt, but uh, uh, for John. John, he had that COVID. Okay. He's on yeah, a respirator. We got him one ventilator. Later, he's, later. He's, yeah, he's been in there about a week now, right? Pretty close. Yeah, I'd say, yeah. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're uh, grateful to come before you this morning. We're looking forward to hearing your your word today, yeah, nice. and it's just so good to uh, to lift up uh, praises and and requests to you, and just rest putting them in your hands, Father. And uh, we we uh, lift up John, who's recovering from COVID, and that's uh, just being on the ventilator has its own difficulties and everything else that goes along with that. We just pray that you would give him uh, strength and full recovery and uh, that you would give the uh, doctors working with him wisdom and abilities there. Also pray for uh, uh, Matt and uh, uh, success with the, with the surgery model, just uh, just full recovery. Um, for your blessings on, on him again for, for strength and abilities with the, with the doctors. We pray uh, for Gary Sutherland, just uh, not uh, certain exactly where the situation is right now and how he's in difficult difficulties, but uh, just pray that you bring comfort uh, to the family and comfort to, to Gary as well. And, uh, pray for uh, uh, Frank's niece, uh, who's got the, uh, she had track ulcers and uh, uh, Angela, and just just for encouragement for the uh, family. Um, it's a, it's difficult with a, such a young one, and, and we're trying to uh, assist and uh, determine what's going on there, but uh, you can give the doctors wisdom, mm -hmm. and uh, you can give the uh, in the comfort and uh, in the family peace. So we just bless that in your hands. Well, we're grateful uh, for Joe doing the walk around and uh, catching that uh, uh, crack in the wheel. And uh, such an unusual thing, but uh, just the fact that he was able to uh, spot it on, on a quick walk around and what a, what a blessing that is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for, both for him and all the people that would have been around him should something have happened. And we just appreciate that, Lord. And uh, Lord, we're uh, also just give you praise and we're just so grateful for the roof project mm -hmm. and everything that you brought into, um, uh, the, the, that you orchestrated and maneuvered from picking the, the contractor that you wanted us to have to raising the funds and uh, now we're just excited to get uh, uh, get started on that. <clears throat> Nothing that uh, you get to show off, but just something that just takes care of a lot of other side issues and keeps us protected. Mm -hmm. And uh, we appreciate that. Lord, we pray, uh, pray for Larry's brother Mike uh, for traveling and uh, just that you bring comfort to that sciatica and, uh, and, and the, the pain and difficulty that can travel. 
cause while traveling. And, uh, just pray that you'd be able to, that we would be able to stop or walk around or do other things to uh, minimize that and that you would keep them safe in this and that you would let them travel at a pace that's that's good for that and uh, and just that you bring comfort there. And we pray for the wrinkles if they're, they're doing the uh, cleanup uh, today and dealing with flood in the basement. No, no easy task and not something you plan on, but it'll burn up the whole day or more uh, trying to recover from that. So just give them strength and uh, prepare them for being able to uh, uh, come worship tomorrow. And Lord, uh, just be with the pastor now uh, and give him the words to speak today and uh, and open our hearts and our minds to hear this and not just hear it, but just act on it and use it Amen. throughout the week. Amen. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Sorry, Sorry I can't get on. Let's show up at this time. <laughs> just, just this time. Just this time. Just this time. <laughs> use it as a car on them. I'm going to really need money. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I got up this morning and thought it was Sunday. I don't want to make the bed. I haven't sleep another hour in the morning. So aren't you going to Bible study? But... <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 23 today, guys. Second Samuel 23. <clears throat> that was perfect. So we got eight guys counting Nick, and we got eight verses to read. So this is this is ideal. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I worked out. <laughs> We're gonna each read a verse starting in verse one. I'll read verse one, and uh, then we'll Come down to verse eight, and that's going to that's going to be our key verse uh, this morning. But we'll, let's read these opening verses together. Wait, where are we at? Second Samuel twenty-three, Larry. We're not all waiting on you or anything. All you one in the bunch, straight. You say three twenty-eight. I'm not there. Is that what you said? I'm lost myself, so I don't know how much by helping the video. I'm still playing this morning. How about we start reading by the time we get over there? There we go. It's like ordering at a restaurant, waiting for the last guy. That's right, yeah. Start over there, my time to get here. 23. Is that right? One through eight? Yeah, one through eight. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. We all good? Are we good? We're good? We're going to go that far. Okay. All right. Verse one, second Samuel 23. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the, the rock of Israel spake to me, he that ruleth over man must be just ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And we let Nick get the next one there, Nick, if you don't mind. Yeah, truly is not my house so with God. For he has made an everlasting covenant with me, ordered in all things, and secured for all my salvation and all my desire. Will he not indeed make it grow? But the sons of Bilal shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall fetch him must be fenced with iron and his staff with a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The poor boy. Now I see why I got this seat. <laughs> I need grace here. Tachmanite, maybe. Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adonai, Adonai, no, Esnite, the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. He really set you up there, don't yeah, he? Yeah, he did. Ouch. <laughs> That's what you get for being away. All right. All right. All right. Uh, so in verse 8, then, we're going to take that phrase. Uh, beginning of the verse, these be the names of the mighty men whom David had. <clears throat> so reading through this, David has always been one of my favorite characters in Scripture. 
And these are some of his last words that he gives here in chapter 23. And as you read through this, you get an understanding of why David was such a great leader. I think there's two primary reasons why, two keys to David's accomplishments as a leader. One is obviously the Lord. As you read through those opening verses there, he talks about the man who was raised up on high. Uh, he talks about in verse uh, one, the anointed of the God of Jacob. Verse two, the spirit of the Lord spake by me. The God of Israel, verse three, the rock of Israel. So he's giving God credit for any accomplishments that uh, he has seen in his reign. It has been the Lord. The Lord has helped him. And he was quick to give God the praise and God the glory. And I think we would do the same thing. Any good that happens in our lives is not because of us. It's because of God's, God's help, God's hand, God working through us. Uh, the Lord helps us to be the spiritual leaders that we need to be. We give him praise. But there's also a second factor here. So it was, it was the God above him that was promoting, elevating, empowering, giving wisdom to David to be the leader, the strong spiritual leader he needed to be. But the second factor, and I think this is, this is maybe not as important, but, but it's right there, number two, in verse eight. So it's not only the God above him, but I think it was these mighty men around David, the, the individuals he surrounded himself with that contributed to his greatness, his accomplishments, because David could not have done what he did on his own. He, he had the help of these mighty men. And I have always enjoyed studying David's mighty men. It's, it's a highlight for me. And I was praying about what to teach on here this morning. And this is going to end up being at least a two-part lesson. Um, but God just directed me. I wasn't even really reading through this. God just put on my heart to bring a lesson on his mighty men. And there's 37. Look, look over in verse 39, last verse of this chapter. Um, he finishes Uriah the Hittite. 30 and 7 in all. So he's 37 men on his list of mighty men. I want to take a minute before we look specifically at three of these mighty men and what they teach us. I want us to go back a book. Go back to 1 Samuel, please. And let's look at chapter 22. Because this is interesting. Who were these mighty men before they were David's mighty men? Where did, where did they come from? And, and I think you're going to see something interesting here. And maybe you already know this, but I, I thought it was worth touching on as we start. First Samuel 22. And let's start in verse 1. It says, David therefore departed thence. So this is before he's king. He's anointed, but, but he's, he's not actually become king yet. Departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And it says uh, here, and when his brethren... And all his father's house heard it. They went down thither to him. And I think there's a, a good lesson there that when somebody we know and love is going through a dark time, they're in the cave, so to speak, the cave of Adullam, that it's on us. We have a responsibility to, to go to that person and really be there for them through that dark time. Um, when we're going through a, a time when we're in the cave, we're going to need people to come be a blessing and, and help to us. And so his family came to him uh, to just be there for him. But also notice in verse 2, beyond family, some other individuals join him. Verse 2, and everyone that was in distress, notice these uh, descriptions here. Everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. So any guesses on who these 400 men are and who will they become? Who are these men here that have some serious issues? Distress, I like the outline there, distress, debt, discontented. I mean, that's quite a description of these individuals. They've got issues, they've got problems. But they come to David, and who will these, who will these men become? Any guesses? His mighty men. His mighty men. Yeah. They, these 400 men here. Now, they're not mighty men when you find them in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, they are men with all kinds of issues. Stressed, discontented. And they come to David and say, David, look, we, 
you know, we need some help. We, we need a captain. We need a leader. Uh, we, we need somebody to believe in us. And I think it's, it's so encouraging that David didn't turn these men away. He, he said, okay, he said, you'll come to me. I'll help you. I'll encourage you. I'll believe in you. And these same men would later be called his mighty men. And, and that's, a, I think, a great blessing us. We go back to 2 Samuel, that Christ is the same way. When we come to Christ with our issues, uh, not David so much, but the son of David, Christ, when we come to him, that he doesn't turn us away. He doesn't cast us out. He knows us. He knows the issues and problems that we have. And he believes in us. And he patiently works with us. And we have a God that can take us from just being a man to being a mighty man for God. There's, there's a vast difference between the two. God has made us men. Praise the Lord for that. But God also wants to make us mighty men. But we got to come to Christ and he can transform us. This was a process. They didn't become mighty men overnight. But uh, through time, uh, God was going to change them. So that was their beginnings. And now we kind of see the end. David, as he's at the end of his life, he's giving some last words. He's giving God praise for his accomplishments, but he's also, uh, he is praising these mighty men and their efforts um, to help him. So I want to look at then this, um, that word there. And I think Christian, he did some, some research on that. Um, mighty men, look in verse Hey, these be the names of the mighty men whom David had. So what does it mean to be a mighty man? So if you look up the word there, Gibor, that's the uh, Hebrew word. Um, it actually means, I lost my, uh, my sheet. Did you steal my sheet? No. This one. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, it means powerful individuals, warriors, or champions. Powerful individuals, warriors, or champions. That's what the word mighty or mighty men means there. Now, I want to then ask this question. What do we learn about mighty men from this passage? What do we learn about mighty men? So keep that question in mind. And we're going to read down. Um, we're going to read through verse 12. So let, let's keep going here in our reading. Let me back up and read 8 again, then read through verse 12. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had, the Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains. The same was Adino the Esnite. He lifted up a spear against Ahunder, whom he slew at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahohite, one of the three mighty men which with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. Verse 11, and after him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop, or was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines, and the Lord wrought a great victory. Now, these are inspiring stories, aren't they? These accounts, I mean, it just kind of like fires you up when you read about these men and, and the, the courage and the boldness, the strength that they have. But again, remember their, their humble beginnings and the issues they had. They came to David with all kinds of problems but now to see where the Lord has brought them. And that should really encourage us that we wake up sometimes in the morning, we don't feel like champions. We don't feel like warriors. We feel like weaklings. We feel like we can't face the day. The, the, the battle is too big. The enemy is too intimidating. But God can change us. God can empower us and make us into mighty men. So what do we learn about mighty men from this passage. Any thoughts on that? I'm going to give you three statements here that connect with these first three mighty men. But any, any opening thoughts before I get into um, the statements I want to give? Anything we learn about mighty men? What makes mighty men so mighty? What do we see they, the character traits in these individuals? Nick? They, I mean, they seem to be working together. It's hard to ignore their past kind of relationship of them bonding together and that having an impact on, on you know, helping them to be victorious. Yeah, that's really good, Nick. Thanks for bringing that out. So the mighty men, right? They're together. There is 
the strength in numbers. My my mom was always, I guess, uh, famous for saying that to us. Boys, stick together. There's safety in numbers, and that's true, isn't it? I mean, in the Christian life, we need each other. That's why we're having this men's study. Is you know, when we're isolated, we're more vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. So uh, we get together. We have church services and men's studies, and we need this because we're stronger together than we are apart. These mighty men, they relied on each other. Sometimes they were by themselves fighting, but they, they always had that group of individuals there to support. So teamwork, that's a, if you want to be a mighty man, join the team, uh, get involved with other mighty men. What, what else do we learn about mighty men here? Anything um, else that jumps out? Mike, you want to start? And we'll start. They, um, they all recognize the Lord and they, they counted yeah. upon the Lord to help yeah. in, in times uh, me. Yeah, they did. And they, I mean, when you talk about being a mighty man, it's not about me trying to like, you know, gather some inner strength that that's been tucked away. It's relying on the Lord and his strength and his might. Several times the Lord wrought the great victory. So we have a tendency to focus on the mighty man, but let's focus on the mighty God empowering the mighty man. The Bible is very clear. Any victory that's accomplished is not because of the man it's the god that that man is relying on yeah good point scott just to say uh just <clears throat> courage which takes you know some of that faith and that belief but just they'll stand and do battle and do whatever yeah. they're supposed to do doesn't yeah. matter doesn't say they're absent of fear it yeah. just means that you're just going to get out and do it yeah so, yeah that's right what's that statement courage is not the absence of fear the, the, it's the knowledge that something's more important than that fear, something along those lines, yeah. you know, that yeah, even the, you know, the greatest of men, they deal with fears, but courage is, hey, what I'm fighting for is more important than this fear that I am feeling. So, yeah, the great men of courage. What what else? Anything else that stands out just from looking at these first three? I think coming off of Nick and, and what Mike said, they're also knit in their vision. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they're not only are they together, but they all have the same, they're marching the same direction yeah. together. Yeah. You yeah. Know, even when they're split apart, they're still going the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Same common goal, same focus. Yeah. They know together the Lord will always have the outcome the way the Lord desires, uh, the Lord's way, yeah. good way, the only way, but, you know, the outcome would be bring honor and glory to the Lord together as yeah. mighty men, brothers yeah. in Christ. Yeah. We we already know, you know that He's going to get that victory. Yeah, that's yeah. They had confidence that they would just follow the Lord. He would give that victory, and He would get that glory. Good, good. Uh, anybody else on this ship? Okay, so let me let me walk through these first three men here. Um, we'll do the best we can with the time we have here, but um, let's look first at Adino or how we're going to pronounce it. I, I was talking to the missionary on Sunday and we both worked for Pastor Powell and Pastor Powell taught both of us. It was kind of interesting. He taught us, if you don't know how to pronounce something, he said, just pronounce it with confidence and everybody will think you know how to pronounce it. So that's what I do. I could be way off, but I just say it like I know. Um, it could be a dino, a dino, ad, ad, a no. I, I, but what I think is kind of interesting, so in the list of 37 men, we recognize some of these names. Some of them stand out a little bit more than others to us um, for whatever reason. Maybe we've studied them a little bit more. They, they have uh, uh, more scripture given to them. But have you ever heard a lesson on this man, Adino, the Esnite? Not me. I, you know, I, maybe I've read his name. I know that. But but as far as a lesson on him, but it's it's interesting. He's number one. Yeah. Now, whether David has them laid out, you know, rank, I don't know if it's according to their rank, but he's the first one that he thinks about when he's writing about the mighty men that had helped him to be the leader he needed to be. He says, you know, I'm thinking about Adino the Esnite. And what I want you to write down for him is mighty men are men of wisdom. Men of wisdom. This man, Adino, was a wise individual. Now, he, he demonstrates other qualities as well. He has courage, um, boldness there. Going to lift up his spear against 800. It's hard to fathom that. One against 800. Um, he slew them at one time. This was, this was not over a period of time. This was 
one battle, one encounter, and he lifts up his spear and, and kills 800. I mean, that just proves the greatest warrior could not do this in his own strength. These men were supernaturally empowered. You can't, the, the odds are too great. One, one guy's not going to defeat 800 unless the Lord is helping this man. It wasn't his spear that did this. It was, it was God. But what I want to point out, and I didn't see this initially, but I want you to notice. So he's called the Tachmanite. And I'm sure there's a lot more here as far as what that word means and you know what that reveals as far as where he's from, his background. But, but notice it says he sat in the seat, chief among the captains. And then it says he lifted up his spear against 800 and slew them one time. This is where the wisdom comes in. This is what the Lord, I think, was, was trying to teach me as I was studying this. That a wise, mighty men are wise men. A wise man knows when to sit and a wise man knows when to stand. He knows when to sit and kind of, you know, just watch things. But then he also knows when to stand up and grab the spear and get involved in the battle. And I think that wisdom is knowing when to be patient and when to engage. And sometimes we're sitting when we should be standing. Sometimes we're standing when we should be sitting. And a wise individual knows when to fight and when not to fight. And this man, Adino, uh, he recognized this. So mighty men are, are wise individuals. I was sitting next to a man. Um, at a baseball game a couple of weeks ago. And I thought with COVID, they would spread people out, but there, I mean, it was just, you know, you're people right in front of you, people right beside you. And those, those uh, seats in the stadium, it's like, you know, you're, you're crammed right next to somebody. So I was talking to this man. And, um, anyways, it, it seemed like he was a Christian. He went to a Mennonite church uh, there in the area. And we were talking about the Lord's song. And I said, have you been to Pirates game for a while? Because he asked where I was from. I said, I'm from Cranberry, you know. He said, no, he's like, I just really don't enjoy professional sports right now. And his biggest thing was he said, it's like they they don't know when to stand, you know, basically what he's saying, you know, and that really bothered him that so many professional athletes are disrespecting our country and our flag. And he said, I just, I can't get past that. Now, it was kind of neat in the, the minor league game we're at, all the players stood, you know, everybody, including the umpires, everybody was hand over the heart, you know. But as you kind of move up, it seems like these more money and, you know, I don't, I don't know what all does it, but, but I thought, you know, that's, that was a good statement. I, I appreciated that individual and, and his take on it because wisdom is knowing when to stand and when to sit. Um, I read the book of Daniel um, or Daniel one to six, not the entire book, but some of Daniel the other day, Daniel chapter three, the, the three Hebrew boys, they were mighty men. They were wise men. They knew this is not a time to fall. This is a time to stand. Even though everybody else is falling, we're going to stand. We're, we're not going to bow to this golden image that's set up. We're going to stand for our God. And it's hard to stand. You know, it, it is tough. In a, in a world that's caving in and compromising, um, God is calling us as mighty men to know when to stand and when to sit. You know, sometimes I find myself maybe making a bigger issue out of something than it should be. And I think discernment is knowing, you know what, that's probably a smaller issue. That, that's not something to get all bent out of shape about. I, I can let that go. But there's other things, big things in life that I need to be willing even to give, give my life for. Chris and I were studying some of the Baptist distinctives yesterday. And as you study Baptist history, you have men and women that literally were willing to give their lives because they believed in these Baptist distinctives, which basically is just Bible doctrine. Yeah. They, they, they believe that if you, you know, if you baptize infants, that's wrong. Um, they believe that scripture is the sole authority for our faith and practice. Um, they don't believe that we need a, a pope or a priest uh, to pray through. I mean, they, and they were willing to give their lives for these things because they had the wisdom to know that this is a battle we need to engage in. So I pray the Lord will give us that same wisdom, knowing when to stand and when to sit. And I think that's this guy, Adino, he understood there's time to sit in the seat and there's time to pick up the spear and get engaged in the battle. And the Lord will help us with that. And now let's move on to Eleazar. Any comments on that before we move to the next guy here? All right. 
Go ahead. I have a question. <laughs> yeah, and not a question, but just a comment. It takes a lot of courage to be a man who goes against the crowd and goes mm -hmm. against, you know, public, yeah, it's, public, it's, you know, it's, public nature or, or sinful nature. And especially now in the times of COVID, when, when you turn and you do something against what the experts want you to do, it's mm -hmm. very, it's very difficult yes. to stand, take a stand because you're outcast. You're thrown into a, a basket of, out, of people who are outcasts. Yeah. And uh, if you just imagine what, um, the three, the three Hebrew boys went through, yeah. you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yep. And I can just imagine, you know, if you know that you, as yeah. I, yep. Yeah, it's not, not easy, but I think when you have in your heart, God gives you a burning conviction about something. That's the key. You have to be so thoroughly convinced and convicted about what, what you're standing for. That doesn't matter. You know, that, if we're just standing, you know, because somebody's standing next to us, yeah. I mean, we have to know in our hearts that if I'm the only person, I am so thoroughly convinced of this, okay. it doesn't matter. If you don't have that conviction, then you won't have, you won't have the courage to stand. Yeah. And I think that Adino and the three Hebrew boys, they knew this is this is worth our stand. All right, let's look at Eleazar next, verse nine to ten. Eleazar. Son of Dodo, the Ahoite, one of the three mighty men with David. That that's a rough one, Dodo, isn't it? I mean, like, I'm sure that if you look the word up, it has a very powerful meaning. But just uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but that was his dad. What's that? I'm not even going to ask. What um, he was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He rose and smote the Philistines in verse 10 until his hand was weary and his hand clave under the sword. And the Lord brought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. So the word I put down is commitment. Mighty men are men of commitment. He was committed to David. It says he was with David. So there's a commitment to his king. And I think we ought to have a commitment to our king, um, King Jesus. We should be committed to be with him. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be with God. We're gonna stand with the Lord. I think we should have a commitment to other uh, individuals in our lives, spiritual leadership, and other mighty men. We're committed to be with them. Um, there's a commitment just to be faithful. He's with David. But then, as these Philistines come up, and when you read about the Philistines in the Bible, I think you know don't think so much about the Philistines, but think about the enemies that we face: the world, the flesh, the devil, our constant foes, and they're fighting the Philistines. And what are most of the men of Israel doing when the Philistines arrive? What do most of the men do? <laughs> they run. They run. Yeah. So the Philistines come, they run. But not David, not his mighty men, and certainly not Eleazar. It says they, they stood. They arose, they smote the Philistines. And it says here that Eleazar smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. You ever, you ever um, work in the shop or... Mm -hmm. doing something out or maybe, maybe it's just you write too much or you type too much but it's like your hand starts cramping up and you can feel it this this guy Eleazar he he has been fighting so long and so hard his hand is weary it says he clave to the sword what do you think that means he, 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 he almost, they almost literally have to pry pry his fingers off of the the sword because he's been fighting so long and I think there's a there's a commitment to David. There's a commitment to his cause. There's a commitment to his sword. Now think about how this ties in. Last week we did this study on the the armor, the spiritual armor. What is the sword? If we want to apply this spiritually, what is the sword that we should be? I mean, holding on to, cleaving to. I mean, it should be in our hands all the time. What is the sword? The word, the word of God, right? The word of God is the sword. So uh, we ought to be holding on to God's word. Uh, it ought to be closer. We've got to cleave to it. The only way we're going to have victory, every piece in the armor there in Ephesians chapter 6, every piece connects to the word of God. What does it mean to put on the whole armor of God? It's really to put on scripture. It is, it is the breastplate. It is the helm. It is the sword. All of it is the word of God. And here's a man, he recognized the value of the sword, and he's, he's holding on to that sword. And the Bible says the Lord brought a great victory. So be committed to God, be committed to God's cause, 
be committed to the word of God. Uh, that's what we learn about mighty men. They're, they're mighty men for a reason. They're men of commitment. I enjoyed the missionary this past week. He yeah. was great. We, we've had just our missions conferences next week. I have similar expectations. We have a, a wonderful keynote speaker coming in, another great family. Um, but the missionary said on Sunday, the importance of commit thy ways unto the Lord. Remember that from Psalm 37. And he demonstrated by stepping off the platform. Commitment means I, I am, I'm fully committing myself. I'm taking this step and mighty men are men of commitments. We got to be committed to some things. Culture, culture runs from commitment. You know, no one wants to be committed to their spouse, their work, you know, their responsibilities, their ministries. We, we, we run from commitment, but mighty men embrace commitment. It's the right kind of commitment. So be committed to, to, to God, his word, the cause. Hey, Pastor, uh, just to kind of draw a parallel, when you said about, um, you know, that his hand, he's been fighting for so long that his hand is kind of wrapped around that sword and they have to pry it open. When you think of the sword that we talked about last week being the Bible, um, it's not something we have to carry around and put down, like losing a sword. It's not something that, that you know, we're going to forget to grab or be so tired that, that it falls out of our hand that when you put the full armor of God on it, it becomes you. It's inside of you. It's the word of God is you. And you just, you kind of become one with it. Uh, you know, thankfully, as opposed to going into battle with a sword, you know, I can imagine some people dropped their sword. Some people broke their sword where the word of God is, is something that can be and dwell inside of you that is, is much more powerful in that regard. Yeah, good parallel. It's not just in the hand. You know, you can have the Bible in your hands. That's good. That's that's a starting place, but that's not an ending point. You got to get it from in your hand to in your heart. It's got to get inside you. Get a good point there, Nick. Thanks. Okay, let's move then to number three, Shama. Shama. This one's really interesting. So in verse 11 and 12. After him was Shama, the son of Agi, the Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered together in a troop. So just, just know that the Philistines are going to keep coming back. Your enemies don't give up. Um, we're going to face these enemies every day. The Philistines are there. They're ruthless, relentless. So now he's fighting the Philistines. It says they're gathered together in a troop where it was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. All right, let's figure out what lentils are. What are lentils? Beans, beans right? Okay, grain. Be so it says here the piece of ground full of lentils. So th this is not, you know, um, we might say, which well, is beans, you know, it's just lentils. Um, and the people are, are fleeing from the Philistines. But notice what happens in verse 12. But he stood. So mighty men stand while others are fleeing. He stood in the midst of the ground. This is the ground full of lentils and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord brought a great victory. Now we read that and we almost think beans, you know, we heard the <laughs> battle of bulge. This is the, the battle of the beans. <laughs> I, you know, okay. We appreciate his courage, but really you're going to risk your life for lentils. But what what's the lesson here? Well, I think this mighty men are men of vision, men of vision see i think shama understood something here shama understood it's not just about the beans if we allow the philistines to take the field of lentils then what's going to be next he had a he had a high level vision he could see beyond the field of beans and he could see if they take this then they're going to take they're not going to stop and and so if we if we can't hold them off here with the beans who, who knows? Next, next it'll be our houses, our kids. You know, they're going to try to take everything. Philistines, they're, they're, they're always wanting more and more. So he just drew a line and said, you're, you're not going to have this. I'm going to defend this because he had the vision to see beyond just the field of lentils. He saw what this meant. So at times in life, we're going to have to draw a line in the sand as well. We're going to say, look, it's not just about the beans. There's something bigger at stake here pastor friend of mine in New Jersey, Pastor Andy Reese. You know, I was talking about Moose. I think that was in my sermon last week. Mm -hmm. So that's his older brother. Andy is the younger brother. We played basketball together as well in college. But Andy's smaller. 
He, he is smaller. <laughs> yes, he is smaller. We had a name for him too, but I can't remember what it was. But anyways, um, Andy uh, is doing great in New Jersey, pastoring in church. Uh, but his church actually, uh, they, they, I don't know if they really want to be in the spotlight, but with COVID, um, they just decided, you know, we're going to, I think they closed for a couple of weeks, but they said, we're going to stay open. And one of the, some guy in their church went to the news media and like, you know, made it a real big deal. So they got all this, you know, all the, the news reporters there and television stations in New Jersey, their governor was not, um, as understanding, not that our governor was really that understanding, but I think he was limited more, Wolf was limited more by um, Pennsylvania law than what Murphy was there in New Jersey. But anyways, uh, the police were coming and they were you know, giving them tickets and fines and they're still in a lawsuit facing, he's facing imprisonment, possible imprisonment. I don't think he will go to prison, but you know, some people thought, you know, come on, just, just, you can have virtual church, you know, what, is this really worth the fines? Is this worth possible imprisonment? But for Andy and for their church, their Bible Baptist church, they just drew a line in the sand and said, you know, it's not just about the beans. There's something, if we cave in here, then what, what are the Philistines going to want next? Yeah. So I think all of us have to evaluate our lives and what's in front of us. Next time they'll close us for something else. What was that? Next next time they'll close us for something else. You see exactly. That. Yeah. Exactly. And and you know I can't really tell you guys in your personal lives. I know as a church we've made some decisions about the future. We're, we're settled on some things, but as far as individually, you have to choose. You know, in your is is it, is it worth defending this field of lentil? Is this you know, is this, is it, do I sit this out? Do I stand? You have to know that, but you, you have to recognize the Philistines always want more. They're always going to want more. So if you came into to this requirement, there's going to be another requirement. At some point you have to stand and defend uh, what's important to you. So I think having vision, vision of the big picture of what's happening is, is really, because some would, again, they would uh, criticize Shama you know, really, you're going to, you're going to risk everything, uh, possibly, you know, make your, your wife a widow and your, your kids orphans because of some beans. But he said, no, it's bigger than that. So may we have that type of vision to see what the enemy is really trying to do. Well, if you look at our culture, you know, there's, it's people say you get used to things over time. And at first there's that shock of kind of change in your culture and, and you're like i i can't believe this is happening right i can't believe they're thinking about doing this but then give it some time and it's it's like the the masses kind of just get used to that and then it's become it becomes accepted without those lines yeah. um you know what you can draw for your own family and say well we don't do that here we don't believe that here and you draw those lines even just starting within your own family yes yes there, we've been very blessed here in America, haven't we, guys? You know, we haven't had to take a lot of stands because of the liberties and freedoms that we have had. But we know the day is coming and, and maybe even is here now where mighty men are going to have to stand up for the truth. And we're going to do it the right way, you know? I mean, I think we understand this. This is a little different day and age, you know? I, I don't think God's telling us to, you know, sharpen our spears and swords and, you know... Again, you're going to have to defend yourself in different ways, but I think the speed, this is a spiritual battle we're facing. I think we have to look, the Philistines, that's not, that's not, you know, a, a politician or it's Satan, it's the world, the flesh and the devil. That's the ones that we're fighting against. We're, we're fighting against them and that system. So make sure that we keep our eyes on who the Philistines really are and who we're facing. Well, back then you're fighting for your life and your property. Now you're kind of fighting for your rights. You know, they can, people can do whatever they want because, um, you know, the law says so. And because things are accepted, you're kind of just fighting for what your rights are. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment. Study the remaining mighty men in this chapter. Um, learn how to pronounce their names properly. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, see what other character traits they display for us. So what mighty men are men of, you know, whatever. And we're going we're gonna to look at uh, the three individuals um, that broke through and got the drink of water for 
David, we're going to look at Abishai, some, um, Benaiah, and then there's just a list of names that we may not focus on them as much because not as much description and details given, but we want to look at um, a few more things here before we finish out this study. All right, any, any other comments or questions before we close in prayer? Interesting, there were 400 <laughs> men there in the cave, right? Now, I think that number would grow to maybe 600, if, if I recall correctly. So that's a lot of guys he had with him, a lot of soldiers. But at the end of his life, David said they're 37. 37 were the mighty men. Now, I, don't, I don't think he was criticizing the other men. I think he appreciated their investment and their help. But he's saying they were out of those 400 or 600 men, there were 37 that I really relied on. And, and my desire, I want to be part of that. 37. I, I want to be in that group that, you know, the king really, God says that's not, you know, not minimizing the other, but I want to be in that group that God says, you know, that's, those are the ones that really stood for me and, and influence. Okay, let's <laughs> close in prayer after later. I think no matter uh, what situation or if you're working, you have a group of men or wherever it's at. You, uh, some men stand out more than uh, than the other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because of their work ethic, just mm -hmm. their personal character. Um, yeah, it's not that we're trying; we're not trying to stand out. It's just you know, it, these men they weren't they didn't they weren't seeking to you know find themselves on the inspired pages of scripture and you know us be talking about them. It, that was not their goal. They just tried to be faithful every day and do what they were supposed to, but they stood out. Yeah, yeah, I know. He can about this. Uh, you know, some men are, or even women, they'll go forward and do things where other people will stay back, and yeah, you know, yeah. you have to carry the ones back, and the other ones you don't, you know, yeah. you don't want to carry them. So yeah. much. They do their part. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the study this morning. We are so grateful for your help, Lord, giving us the understanding and wisdom to unpackage this passage and, uh, Lord, to discover some spiritual truths that are applicable for our lives today. We're so grateful for the sword, the word of God, that uh, sometimes convicts us, uh, Lord, it, it cuts us personally. Uh, sometimes we use it for defense. Um, but Lord, it's, it's there in our hands and we pray in our hearts that we would hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against you. And Lord, I pray that we would be thoroughly convinced of what we believe, what scripture is teaching us, the convictions, Lord, personal convictions that we will not compromise upon. Lord, thank you for the, the brotherhood of Christ that we enjoy. Thank you for the mighty men that you've raised up, Lord. Uh, I, too, would testify with David, Lord, any good that's been accomplished through this church and this ministry is one because of the fact that you have blessed and, and you have helped. But Lord, secondly, because of the mighty men, uh, I don't think that any of us would necessarily call ourselves mighty men. We would not claim that. But Lord, you have blessed with strong male leadership, spiritual male leadership in this place. Um, we, we enjoy that. We're grateful for it. And uh, Lord, I'm, I'm grateful for these men that support me and encourage me. Times that I get down or discouraged or frustrated about things, I know that uh, one of these men in this room or others in our church will, will be there for me. And I'm so thankful for that. And Lord, we uh, pray that we would follow the, the steps and the example of these three men before us. Uh, Lord, please give us the, the wisdom. Please give us the commitment and the vision that we need um, to serve you today. Much easier to study this than to live this. So Lord, help us to go and live it today and bless our day. May we be led by your spirit in all that we do and say in Jesus name, amen. amen. Thanks, for coming, guys. Thanks guys, be strong, have a good day. All right, you too, Nick. You'll go figure it out, I am tired. <laughs> rest. I have to ask you guys a question. Yes, this this is completely off topic. <laughs> Sorry, this week I've been called to 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 go to jury duty. Okay, and fucking Butler.